Welcome to The Aftermath, a podcast that rips the band-aid off the collective scars of divorce, custody battles, and the trauma of family drama. Kendra Ryber and Mick Smith pull back the curtain and explore stories that put the heart-wrenching puzzle pieces together with inspiring stories, notable experts, and actionable tips. Let the healing begin. And this is the Dr. Digital co-host of The Aftermath, and Kendra. Kendra, how are you doing today? I'm absolutely wonderful, Mick. I'm so excited because I think last time we talked, we were talking about the new bill in Ohio um, that's going to pass for custody, and so it's coming out 50-50 when you, is proposed, is when you first separate or divorce, it'll be a 50-50 equal shared parenting. So that means you act just as if you are married, but you are divorced and you're co-parenting. So there will be no legal issues, hopefully, over somebody getting one getting custody and one getting visitation. So that was just announced today. So I'm in a great mood. <laughs> I understand. And the bill has not been given a number yet, but I stay up on the updates. This is in Ohio. You can comment on the bill and you can see it, which is pretty awesome. So some progress and some movement in that direction. So I can't blame you for being excited about that. Yes. And likewise, so we have Susan show for her today it is unbelievable. We've got to hear all the great things that she has in terms of her background. She's a CD, CDC coach, certified divorce coach. She has an MBA agency licensed private investigator. So you got to wonder what's going on looking at what have you. And also the TEDx talk, I'm telling you, if you're going to watch it like I did, it came so close to my own situation and what I experienced and keep a box of tissues handy because she nails parental alienation. And with that, welcome to the show, Susan. We're so excited about having you on our show and thank you for spending some time with us today. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me join you. So can you tell us a little bit about your background and gave an introduction, but with so many things, what would you say about yourself and what can you introduce in terms of background so that we can get chatting with you and find out all the great stuff that you have to share with us? Well, you pretty much nailed it. Pretty much nailed it. I'm a CDC certified divorce coach. I was a long time agency licensed private investigator. My, my background is in fraud. So. My clients, when they hire me as a divorce coach, the PI hat is on, the divorce coach hat is on, and the mom hat is on. And I've been through my own protracted long-term high-conflict divorce many years ago, way past it. And now my children who were subjected to all that are young adults. And yes, I had them when I was 12. <laughs> That's um, what I was assuming. <laughs> We've moved on in that respect. And yes, I have given a TEDx talk on the topic of parental alienation. And when I was asked to give that the talk, I was very clear that I wanted to give it from the perspective of the child because mm -hmm. oftentimes targeted parents are so upset about not having their child, they forget that the true victim of this very heinous crime is really the child because they live with it forever. They, they carry this for the rest of their lives. And, you know, this is why I said I, I had to have a box of tissues when I was watching because it seemed close to, so close to my situation. You give an example of a daughter. My daughter was between five and eight when this was happening. So it was right at the age that you're describing. But one of the points that you made was how a person as an adult may go into confusing wow. love and hate and also getting into abusive relationships as a result of what happened. Is that what you find through your experience and counseling through divorce? Fabulous question. It's hard to tell. I have spoken with over 325 adults who were once alienated children and they, and none of them were solicited by me. They've either sent me letters or examples just like today. You know, we've never met, Mick, and here you're telling me you've had this experience. It is so common. And what people usually tell me is that this really has ruined their lives. And the people my who, who, with whom I've spoken to have been alienated, it range in ages 22 to 66. What's relatively consistent is they all knew who the alienator was. 
the person who had more money, perceived power, they saw what that person did to their other parent, and they didn't want to be the recipient. No different than bullies. Like if we look at bullies on the playground, there's two groups of kids. Let's look at a playground. You have a bully. He's bullying another kid. And then you have two groups. We have what's called the innocent bystanders who don't say anything. They just stand back. They don't want to be part of it. And then you have those who join in with the bully. Those two groups, the people that join in or the kids that join in and the people, who, the kids who don't, they don't want to be a kid who's being bullied. Hmm. Behave in two different ways, but for the same reason. So the child who joins in with that parent, false narrative, listens to that, doesn't want to be the recipient of what they know the other parent receives. A lot of times my clients will say to me, I don't know why my 10-year-old just doesn't tell dad that he loves me and wants to be with me. And I, and I always remind them, you're, you're an adult and you're reaching out to me to help you because you're afraid of that person. What about a helpless 10-year-old? Where are they going? What else can they do? Right. We get that. And, and it does carry with them for a very long time because they're forced to make a decision. Who do they like better? This is what it really comes down to. Do I like better? Do I like dad? Yeah, it's crazy when you think about it. When you make a decision to get divorced or when you are forced into divorce or whatever the however that plays out. You never made the decision to divorce your kids. And they never made the decision to divorce you. And they were always half of your DNA. And so they will always love you. And so I think this is a very interesting perspective on, and I like how you talk about the adult children, because I think viewing it through their eyes when they're older and then looking back and assessing it, trying to figure out what happened and any psychological damage or, you know, trauma that they have that follows them on how to fix right how to change that perspective maybe how to go back so maybe let's start with if you have a child that you haven't seen in a little while do you force them into seeing you what is your opinion on that how, from the child's eyes and perspective and the situation they're in and understanding their environment do you force the child to see you because that's what we want as parents right but do you force the child to have a relationship with you when they are controlled by the alienator well the question becomes what is force if you have young children and they're alienated and they're still within that framework of the other parent has violated a custody arrangement and then the ch children are now being forced to be with you oftentimes there is a suggestion of reunification therapy Forcing is is really a hard term to use because, it, and it really depends on when what age they are. If they're sixteen, it's really you know if they're teenagers. They're difficult anyway in on maths. I mean, generally speaking, so if they say things like oh, "I don't want to talk to you," they don't want to in normal environments. They don't want to talk to you, and how do you want to make a sixteen year old talk to you? I and when I work with my clients, I talk about the ways to speak to these kids because. Take everything that you know about speaking with kids out of the equation. Because we as targeted parents believe that we should say certain things and it just doesn't work. There's a way to talk to the kids. For example, a lot of times when parents get this one maybe day or a couple of hours to be with a the child they haven't seen, they start going through the litany of questions. How's school? Who's your friends? What are you doing? And the child feels interrogated. So they just kind of recoil. And they're getting interrogated by the other parent. Yes. Mm -hmm. Don't say this when you go to your mom's. Don't let them know about my girlfriend. Don't do this. Don't do that. Yeah, I mean, they, these kids got a lot to remember. What we forget is we don't know what's going on the other side. It's not good, but we don't know what they're hearing all the time. And so when they're with you, they just don't need more of what they consider to be the same. Mm. So there's kind of ways to chill back and talk to them a little different. Really good advice. Really good advice. Isn't there something to be said when parents need to remain being parents? In other words, when Kendra asked the question of force, I mean, I was a parent and of a smaller child, and my attitude was more or less, I guess, the way I was raised. Mom and dad decides, in this case, 
I'm deciding because I think you have to keep the roles clear. And I would say, I'm the parent, you're the child, this is what you're doing. And I applied that when it came to other activities. So mom signed up child for dance class. I had nothing to do with it, but I still supported it. I said, you're signed up, you're going to go. And I was always the parent because I felt that's my role. And so what I'm saying, isn't it better to keep the roles clear and not allow the child to say, I am going to do this. I'm not going to do that. There's still a child. You decide. I agree with you, but it really depends on what's going on with the other side. This past year, I've had over 10 clients with children 10 years old and younger who are now saying F you to the parent. And this is no, and it is stunning. One of the clients, the parents are attorneys. They, it, the alienator should know better. And oftentimes this 10 year old, nine year old, seven year old, and as young as seven is spewing this venom to the targeted parent. And the other parent is standing there and saying, well, you know, of course they say that about you. <laughs> they can't stand you like I can't stand you. I, I mean, this is not good parenting by any stretch. And what do you do about that? What do you do about that kind of language? I mean, none of us would have ever considered saying that to our parents. Not only is this child mm -hmm. saying it, but they're getting sanctioned mm -hmm. by the other parent to say it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I actually have heard other parents, you know, my clients will take the video and say, look, is this, you know, look what's going on. And the child's just saying horrible things. You're, you're F you. I, I can't stand you. I don't want to be around you. I wish you were dead. And when my client will say to the other parent, you, you know, you really, this isn't okay for them to talk like that. Then the other parent's like, I can't stand you. They can't stand you either. They, they're calling it right. You're an ass, you know, whatever it is that they say. And the kid is emboldened to talk like this. And the question you asked a couple moments ago is about how does this carry on into the rest of their lives, you know, about relationships? Well, here it is. Here's the foundation. Just talk to anybody the way you want. And don't think this does not creep into other parts of their lives before they become adults. These yeah. kids then say this to teachers. I have a client who said that her, her daughter's best friend's mother called her and said, guess what? Your daughter said, F you to me today. She's not allowed to come over anymore. Yeah. Is, you know, what do you do with that? And they'll say it to teachers. They'll say it to you know, school headmasters, principals. They'll say it when they get into the workforce. They'll say to college professors, they'll be belligerent. They don't have to do with, you know, because the alienator or the parent who's creating this whole mm -hmm. area does so with giving the child entitlement. You don't have to yeah. play. You don't have to listen to your mother or father. You don't have to. You don't have to. And that extends. I have something called alienating parents don't hear it. That extends into the classroom. So, for example, you have a 10th grader who failed a math test. What would a normal parent do? Mick said, you know, I'm still the parent. You know, there's rules. So it's typical for you to say maybe to your 10th grader who now thinking about college, right? 10th grade, 11th grade, grains matter, don't they? And you say, listen, you can't go to the party next weekend. You got a deal on a math test. You got midterms coming. Normal, normal parody. The alienator will say things such as, I don't want to teach you. You all have to listen. That's crazy. It's just, it's disrespectful. You know, it's not teaching them anything. Well, they're not there to teach the child. Alienating yeah. parents don't parent. The, what that parent wants to do is lure the child away from the other parent, period. That's the game plan. And when you have a 14 or 15 year old who, you know, wants to have a party on the weekend, a boyfriend sleepover, drink some beer. And then you have the other parent who's like, you have chores. You got to clean the litter pan. You got to take the dog out for a walk. You're taking out the trash. What is that child going to be? Where do, they, where do you think they want to go? Of course, they want to go with a fun parent with no rules. Absolutely. And, and so the lure just with that, and that's very surface. But there's also a lot of other things that go on underneath. And it's, it really is a challenge, especially as they get older. The little ones... It's a little easier because if they're not being dropped off in time, if there's real clear interference, custody interference or visitation interference becomes more obvious, even though they're saying bizarre things. 
bizarre things like, I don't want to go to mom's house because she took all the money in the divorce from dad. I had a client who's five-year-old said that. My six-year-old said hear that. that. Yeah. We should hear that on Blue's Clues. I don't think so. When they get to be teenagers, it's, it's harder. It's more of a challenge because they have more, more of their own mindset. Even though they've been coerced, even though they're being lured, even though they have dangling carrots of car. Car. Their mom says, no, you're not getting a car until, you know, you can prove with your grades or whatever it is. And dad's like, what are you talking about? I got a BMW sports car waiting for you. And tell your mom to go to hell. So how do you coach your clients on how to handle situations like that when they don't feel like they have, as Mick said, any parenting control? Well, you have to switch up your game plan a little. Yes, you still have to be the parent. And, and again, each situation is different in how old are the children. I can't give a blanket statement for the age of the child. It's different for a nine-year-old than a 15-year-old. Also, it has a lot to do with the sex of the child. Sometimes a child wants to be with the same sex parent because that parent is luring them with things that they know they like. Moms may lure the you know, 12 and 13 year old with, yeah, we'll have manis and petties, we'll get her hair done, whatever it is. And then dad can say, you know, we're going to sports. So it really depends. That's a hard question to ask. It, it really is individualized. And it, it also has to do with, I, as, as I get to know a client, what their comfort level is, how to say what they say, and if, if they can keep it calm when they say it, if they can lean back from creating a lot. You know, some people are more anxious and they just want to kind of pounce and other people know how to chill. And chill is always the better with these kids. You know, you just say like, I get it, but you know, you got to really do this. Here's why. Instead of, I know when you're at your dad's, he lets you do whatever you want, but in this house, nah. That doesn't work. Mistakes I've made, definitely, as I'm we learning. All do. We all do. <laughs> so you talk to so many different clients and you help so many different people in your coaching. And, you know, I guess they're coming to you when they realize that they have an issue with parental alienation that might be happening. Do you uh -huh. see it blanket? stories come to you are they all the same are they all different talk to us about that they're pretty much the same i have clients all over the world we're getting ready to put a map up we're opening up a resource center mm -hmm. which is all online of course but a map of where i coach and it's all over the world i have clients in singapore i have them in australia and canada and what is stunning and i will say to them you're across the world and your scenario is exactly the same playbook is almost exact. Now, how to resolve it, that's, that's where the challenge comes in because there's so many different factors, different laws in different countries, the judicial system. Even here where I am and as a private investigator, I can tell you right in Baltimore County, we have five hearings and I could take a case, a set of facts, present it to one judge, the ling will be one way, step right into the next courtroom, same set of facts, same mm -hmm. presentation, the ruling may be different. It could be different in a minor way, in a major way. And so that's hard. It's really hard to determine how a judge is going to resolve something. I always suggest to people that they try to settle things up instead of going in front of a judge. But with mm -hmm. these parental alienation cases, people are back in the courtroom. And interesting, the majority of my, and, and by the way, I don't just get parental alienation cases. I get a lot of cases where people come in, they're just starting their divorce. It's very high conflicted. They want to make sure that they go through this in a way that they don't lose their shirt, lose their sanity to learn the process. But I would say maybe 75% of what I get does have parental alienation with it or stands alone. The ones that stand alone, interesting. Are, are, are already divorced. I have clients who, after seven years of being divorced, the parental alienation kicks. Wow. Can you say something about parental alienation? I know this is one of those areas that you're really an expert in. And my question is in talking to experts, there seems to be still a, kind of a wide range of opinion. Some don't even recognize it. And it hasn't really been enshrined in the psychological literature yet. 
but it's so powerful. I mean, if a person watches your TEDx talk, I'm telling you, like you just nail it and it's so real. But why is it that this is taking so long for it to be recognized by the legal profession and by the psychological profession? Or are there signs of hope that maybe it's more recognized than it had been previously? Huge, huge question. And it's one I get all the day, all day, every day. I can't really speak. I don't want to say something in general because it really depends on, again, the courthouse, the judge. There's some judges who believe it. And I've seen judges say, this sounds like parental alienation to me and we're going to stop it right here. Hmm. And then I've heard other judges say, I I'm sorry, I don't believe in that. It's junk science. I don't believe in it. Well, you know, <laughs> I, I mean, what do you do with that? For the parent who is the recipient, this is very real. And what is, and, and I know there's a lot of people in my space, the divorce space, that don't believe, or divorcing a narcissist space, whatever it is, that don't believe in it. They call junk science. They say it doesn't happen, that the alienator must have done something, or they're really the abuser. Hmm. I've done this a long time. That is not true. Does that happen that way? Of course. The majority of people who come to me are so brokenhearted because they have no idea. And their counselor said, this is the nicest person we don't know. Other than there's a narrative. And the narrative is fed to the child and it's a false narrative. The children can be a converse. You know, they, I mean, they have two parents who love them. They think, assume, and they assume that their children are going to tell them the truth. So when one parent says, you know, I know your mom's giving you cough medicine, but don't take it. She's trying to poison you. What is that? That's very, that's not anything the mother did wrong. It's nothing she did wrong. And that same child now will not eat at the mother's house. And the father is packing food in little Ziplocs to send for, with the child. How is that the mother's fault? It's not. So people who are going through this, they almost feel like they're bullied by their ex via the child and they're also bullied by a system who's saying this isn't true and that's really really tough i always say an alienator is a ventriloquist they don't say anything the child's mouth is moved kindred God. and the, isn't that true <laughs> well, it's the gosh isn't that true i you're just you are you're nailing it <laughs> And a lot of times children say things that just don't make sense for their age. When an eight-year-old says something like, I'm not going to mom's house. I like, mom, I can't stand you. You know, you spend all dad's money. And like, you really had to redecorate. You really had, I'm not, forget it. I'm not coming over. What nine-year-old boy talks like that? Or a six-year-old who says, I don't, I don't like dad's girlfriend. She's, and I don't want to say a bad word, but. And says something that is so not part of a six-year-old language. And you could hear an angry mom say that. And interesting enough, the parental alienation I typically see is well after the divorce. Well after the divorce. And usually I'll say to my client, have you started dating again? They're like, yeah, how did you know that? About a year ago, I had somebody come to me. They're in Canada. It's all like all I can say. And she's been divorced four years. She had a good relationship with both of her kids. And suddenly they didn't want to see her. Anymore. She started dating somebody. She's allowed to four years post-divorce. Dad was driving by her house with the children to have them look into the garage to see if there was a car, her boyfriend's car. And there was not. This dad convinced the children that she likes the boyfriend more than she likes the kids, that she actually knew the boyfriend and dated him before they got divorced. No, the dad was from the United States and went to Canada like the year before. <laughs> she had no idea who this man was. And it was so bad that these children wouldn't even go near her. So we know that the narrative from the other parent is being fed to the child. How can anybody tell me that's junk science? How can anybody tell me that that mother precipitated that or did anything to cause that or create that? Here's what did happen. She went on with her life. 
Your ex-husband doesn't like it. He can no longer control her. He can't do anything about it other than, let's see, her kids against her. We all can almost agree the system doesn't work at all. And what you're saying, you can go into two different courtrooms, two different judges, and they rule completely differently based on the same set of objective facts. So that's got to be frustrating. So my yeah. question is maybe something you can't answer, but then what can be done or what could be possibly done for a system that is so completely broken and doesn't follow what you would think would be rational procedural conclusions based on the evidence? Every day, that is a challenge for people who are going through this because it has to be presented in the court in a way that it is perceived that the other parent is really going through a very specific playbook in order to lure the child away from having anything to do with the other parent who, by the way, child has a right to both parents, two loving parents. That's the child's right. And there's a parent who has appointed and anointed themselves as the decider whether the child gets to see the other parent. And I've seen unbelievable scenarios what people will go through in order to keep the child away. For example, just this past year, I've had three clients whose husbands, and they're in rural areas, we don't see this in big cities, whose husbands went to like universities to get pastor, pastor license to be a minister. And then they bully their ex by their ministry. The one church in more small, you know, Southern community, rural community. And he gets up on the pulpit and talks about evil demons, the women who are the evil demons and the devil. And, and all of a sudden the 10 year old is like, you're the devil. You want to kill me. And, and he's got this whole community that thinks he's the greatest thing in the world. And he's, he's just eviscerating his ex-wife via the child. That's, that's a newbie. <laughs> so the, the extent that somebody will go through is, is absolutely stunning. And I just want to think I see, I've seen it all in from stage left comes another, another scenario of creativity. Do you think there's something trending or happening in the world, or maybe we're just more aware of the alienation cases? And maybe it it was happening before, but we weren't aware. And I believe that it was happening to more men who probably gave up from their kids because they 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 didn't know how to fight it. Or is something really trending that's that's causing this? I think it's becoming more prevalent. I hear it all over the place. And well, of course I hear it. <laughs> I would hear it. <laughs> However, if it, when somebody hears what I do, they'll, they'll say, oh, my, this happened to my sister. She hasn't seen her kids. It, it's very hard for people to fess up that it's happening to them because, you know, no matter how much you say to somebody, you know, my kids aren't talking. When the people you're talking to walk away, they, you know, somewhere they, she had to do something. Their kids wouldn't hate her. You know, there's this guilt. It's, you wonder, you know, how can kinder smile? <laughs> you wonder, do people believe me? Because it's so unbelievable. Mick and I have talked about this before is you <laughs> have to, and Mick says it better than what I do, but find the people that are like you. It's like AA, right? Because normal people don't understand what you're mm -hmm. going through. And when you tell them like, just exactly what you said, they walk away. But, and they, they're thinking, what did she do? You know, is it really something she did? The other thing too, is that the person who is alienating the kids is really, masterful at creating community for people who deal with like more narcissistic borderline personality and experts will say they collect flying monkeys, which are people that may even be in your own camp, your friends, your family, all of a sudden say, you know, yeah, she must be doing something. I never saw her do anything weird, but you know, the kids wouldn't hate her if she wasn't. You never know what happens behind closed doors. And that's true. But we also know. We also know the neighbors and these, and, and the adults that I have spoken to who were alienated 
stories are stories are really sad. And if we just take them from then and move them to now, they're pretty much the same. But I think it's more prevalent now because of social media. Kids have cell phones. I've seen, I had a client once who was being alienated and her ex-husband, even though she paid for the cell phones, collected the children's cell phones at night and locked them up to assure that they didn't reach out to the mom. Wow. Can you talk a little bit about how you identify if you're going through a high conflict divorce and you not just blow things off and think, oh, it'll get better in a month? It's, it's not hard. <laughs> it's not hard. Usually there is somebody files, there's threats made. My clients will tell me things like, I was told I'll pay for this. And they see that they are money. It's hidden. Sometimes people have, I, 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 wow, the story is about, that's a really good question because I hear it so much. It, it, it doesn't take much. Usually somebody who comes to me will start with, I'm divorcing a narcissist. And I take that tongue in cheek because I hear it all the time. I don't know if their spouse is a narcissist. Let me start to tell me the things that were going on in their marriage. It doesn't start with when they go to get divorced. There's been some pretty rough stuff going on before then that's been hard to deal with, which is why they're getting a divorce. And the person starts to wreak habit with them, makes threats. You're not going to get this. I'm going to see to it that you're not getting retirement money and money gets funneled around. Things go missing, money, bank account, large purchases are made. And when the person who's creating the high conflict realizes, recognizes, probably already knows that, yeah, that's upsetting you, the recipient of this, but you love the kids more than anything. They just go towards the kids. That's just another, another boy. It doesn't take long to, to figure out. Somebody so as soon as you, is someone with they're, they're they're in trouble. And they've also seen the person do other things to other people. They'll say, you should have seen what they, they did the same thing to their brother or to their sister or to their mom. I'm, there's a pattern. So it doesn't, it t- doesn't take long to see them. It's very high conflict. And it escalates. Unless sometimes, though, people are blind to it, right? Because they've loved that person for how many years? So they might not see it until they have to step back and evaluate it or maybe mm-hmm. talk to their friends and family, you know, and say, hey, we're getting divorced. And they'll their friends and family will validate, well, yeah, we kind of see this coming or we, we've seen these trends. And so I think it takes a little while maybe for some of them that are that are blind to it because of their marriage. Mm-hmm. But as soon as they start to recognize it, is that when you uh-huh. would suggest they reach out to a divorce coach like yourself and get help at the beginning? Absolutely. Rather than I mean, waiting, I'll wait and see how it goes for a month or two. No, 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 absolutely. There are people who... who Maybe we'll meet with me. Now I have somebody else kind of who's flooded. <laughs> somebody will meet with me and they'll start to tell me what I am very clear is going to get ugly in about four or five months. But it hasn't gotten ugly enough for them to do anything. Right. But you're trying to prevent the ugliness. You know what? But that's human nature. I mean, we tell people lose weight, you know, work out, or you're going to have a heart attack, your blood pressure is high, your cholesterol is high. Like, yeah, I get around to it when I do, they don't. And then, you know, (laughs) they have some trouble. And the same thing applies here. And then they reach out to me in five or six months and they'll say, oh my gosh, you're not going to believe how bad this has gotten. I haven't seen my kids in two months. The bank accounts are cleaned out. The lawyer that I got doesn't know what's going on. (laughs) And then it's harder. It's harder harder to fight that it it gets more it gets to be more expensive when people come to me and we start at ground level the saving of money time and heartbreak really gets diminished we talk about how to get the right attorney and my clients get fabulous attorneys there's attorneys and there's attorneys there's attorneys who understand high conflict and then there's attorneys who really get it and know how to litigate it know how to kind of stop it in its tracks and, you know, at certain benchmark times. Uh, we talk about how to be the, the best client for their attorney so you don't get on your client, your attorney's nerves. We talk about 
and they learn about parental alienation, many of them are already starting to see the under underpinning. I think that's a very good point. Your attorney is not your therapist. You do not call them every day and ask for advice. The other thing, too, that I say to people, when you're going through a high-conflict divorce, you need a team. I have a great divorce coach, a fabulous attorney, but you have to know how to get the right attorney, which we work with with people. You also should maybe have a therapist and people say, like, that's crazy. Like, no, it's not. I'll ask them, like, tell me about your your wedding and they'll tell me about the entourage they had, the, the limo driver, you know, the like, caterer, where they got their dresses, where the makeup artist, the hair person. I go, okay, you'd spend all that time with an entourage of people, like 14 different people for a four day event. And now you want to skimp on something as important as this. If you get it right from the beginning, you save tens of thousands of dollars, seriously. And if you're in places like LA or New York or DC, Florida, I was just going to say, may save hundreds of dollars. A lot of people will have lines of separation between what you do as a coach and the legal profession. But I'd really like to know if you offer some tips on how to choose a big attorney and a right attorney, because often you get the first one, somebody picks up the phone, that's my attorney. But what would you suggest if a person is in that process to help them through going through the entire divorce proceeding? Most of the clients who come to me are on their second or third attorney. People usually hire attorneys based on referral. They like the parking. They like the colors in the office. <laughs> Instead of asking really specific questions. A lot of times people come to me with collaborative attorneys and that's fabulous. Collaborative divorces are much better and that's a big movement and the majority of divorces are collaborative. But if you're in a high conflict situation, you need somebody who really gets it. And my first question, when most people reach out to me, they want to tell me a whole story about what their ex is doing and how terrible it is. But I'll ask the question, tell me what kind of attorney they have. Oh my gosh, they have a bulldog, they have a shark. Okay, what kind of attorney do you have? Well, collaborative. And I'm like, nope, it's not going to work. You really need somebody that can go. And, and I he, you know, it's, it's hard to say you want to be equally on that same level playing field when it comes to attorneys, but one really needs to be. They have to have somebody who clearly understands a high conflict divorce, or some people say divorcing a narcissist, however you want to word it. Not only do they have to know that what you're dealing with, but they also know how to successfully litigate it. And that's different. And I've been in the courtroom a lot as a PI, and then I've been cross-examined by tons of them. And then <laughs> attorneys, and some are really powerful and know how to litigate very well, and some don't. And, and I've had over several, you know, I've had probably about 1,200 actual testifying hours, and the good ones are fantastic. And somebody, and when I say testifying, not, not in the divorce space, but as a PI. And, and I always tell my clients, I was in the courtroom with evidence. One side loved me because I had the evidence and another side hated me because I had the same evidence. And that's where they're going to be also when they go into the courtroom. So they need counsel, really understands it and litigate. So we work on questions to ask anybody you're interviewing and the answers to get, not just the questions but the answers so that you know how your case is going to go. And remember, you pay them. It doesn't mean you have to be snarky and obnoxious, but they work for you. You don't work for them. And they have to work this case for you. And if they can't, then they should tell you right up front. I think that's so important because if you don't choose the right attorney with a level playing field, I think you will quickly be on the defense and it's mm -hmm. so hard to pull yourself out of that hole it is extremely hard so I know I talk to lots of different friends and acquaintances and again they're blind to it or like oh we'll solve it or you know I have an attorney that's going to try to smooth things over no absolutely not I agree with you Susan it's just not going to happen it's not it's not. And I and I thank you for saying it because sometimes when I say people are like we're just trying to sell it's like no I'm not 
No, I'm just telling you how it is. And if you're not on an equal layer playing field, or I'll say you're equally lawyered up, which that sounds kind of obnoxious, but if you're not, it's true. Once it starts going badly, it didn't get better. It spirals downward because the person's out of their league. Not all attorneys are the same. The person may be lovely. They may be a fabulous attorney, just not for you. So the scenario I always give, for example, maybe you're born with some kind of heart condition. It's not going to kill you. You just feel kind of lousy, tired. It's congenital. And your doctor sends you to a pulmonologist who has a regimen and you feel well 70, 75% of the time. But you find out there's a doctor who has a regimen and people feel well 99% of the time. There's no doubt where you're going to go. The same thing should apply with counsel, with legal counsel, because this will make all the difference in the world. The next thing I do want to say about that, and I know that there's people who want to go into the courtroom per se, which means they, they represent themselves. They're, they don't want or can afford an attorney. This is not the time to do it. Because if your spouse has a really tough attorney, sometimes people say short bulldog. I don't know if I like those terms, but if they have a really savvy attorney yeah. who most attorneys are challenged, you know, to, 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 you know, go, go against. What do you think you're going to be able to do? I mean, these people, let's not forget, they went to college, they majored in government, history, you know, political science, they went to law school, they were contracts, many have been public defenders, prosecutors, they're litigators. And you have none of that experience. And I know sometimes people in smaller courthouses may do that. I don't recommend that in bigger cities. That just just is not smart. Get it right from the beginning. Kendra, you're absolutely right. When you know this is happening, just get it right. It will change the trajectory of the divorce. And and listen to me. I've experienced it. I've gone down that <laughs> hole and I <laughs> tried to dig myself out. So yes, listen to me. It's from experience. <laughs> Can you touch on maybe giving some advice that you've had from adults that you've talked to that has been alienated as children. And if they're reconnecting with their families or maybe that already they've already done that with their other, their other parent, what advice would you give alienated parents now on what to do or what not to do in general? Do you send cards? Do you keep reaching out? Does that make them feel guilty or does that make them feel because they can't, you know, respond to you or they can't have that relationship with you. Do you have any general kind of guidelines for that? I always tell parents to never give up. Now that means different things to different people. You've got a six-year-old, that means you have to keep fighting in the court system to get that, that six-year-old. Your children are adults and beyond being a minor child, that has a different feel to it. Sometimes when kids go off to college, parents will say to me, well, now they're off to college, I can go visit them on campus. But if the other parent says, listen, I'm paying for your college, you talk to your mom, all bits are off. And I've seen that happen also. I don't think that there's a general rule of thumb. I think you have to look at it. I think you have to look at it individually. Do you take the lead of the child on that? Do you wait for them to reach out to you if they're a little older? Sometimes they do. Interesting enough. And this is a wonderful, well, not wonderful, but when I gave my TEDx talk, it was on a Sunday and somebody came up to me afterwards and she said, while you were giving your talk, I almost got sick. He said, oh, I'm sorry. And then she goes, no, 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 you don't understand. And she told me she was 32 and she had not seen her father since she was 15, her mother. And she said, when you said the part where the daughter says things that she doesn't remember, but she speaks that as though it's the truth, but it's not really. She said, my mom told me that the, my dad left because he hated me. And she said, it's been 17 years. Do you think I should call him? Now, you can imagine that day is a flurry of activity. <laughs> I'm stopped in the corridor. And I said to her, I don't really know, you know. <laughs> but when I got back to the Baltimore the next day, in my DM was a comment from her. She called her dad. And it was about a week before America's Thanksgiving. And he said, this is my Thanksgiving gift. I've been waiting for this call. Oh, that makes and me tear up. 
They met at Starbucks and she has had two little boys at this point, a two and a four year old. And she said, he told her that he tried for years to see her. The mom kept, kept him from her and ran him through the court system until he couldn't afford it anymore. And he was waiting for this day. And she invited him over for Thanksgiving and they met his grandsons and then they all went to Disney World. He went to Disney World for winter break. And then she also said to me that she will never speak to her mother again. Hmm. Wow. And that's not because children should, what, no matter what your age, be able to speak to both parents. But listen, I mean, the mom told her an absolute mis, you know, it wasn't true. Now, there are times, and, and I know there's something called estrangement. I don't want to go off into the weeds about this, where parents really do something. I've had parents call me and say, I'm alienated from my child. And I get some background information and they'll say things like, okay, I left my kids about six years ago. But here's the thing. I was like on a mission to find myself and find my inner child. And now I'm back and they don't want to talk to me. And, and my ex isn't supporting that. It's like, okay, oh, yeah, I walked out. And like this, yeah, that's this a little different. alienation. Let's, let's talk about what this really is. You have to own this. Right. But in a situation like, what I just described with the woman I met at the 10X talk, it's really strong. I mean, and, and I told her, in my opinion, I thought her dad and she should go into therapy because they missed a lot of time. Both. Yeah. Can you tell us, and I know we're getting ready to wrap up, but I would love to hear how you came to find your passion in doing what you're doing now. Truthfully, I was minding my own business as a private investigator, love investigator work. That is so my jam. And uh, as I said, when people and I work together, they get a PI hat and they also get a divorce coach hat. And I was giving a talk with a, a social worker we were talking about divorce and, and I had been through divorce and she said, no, you really have this divorce stuff on. You really get it. You should be a divorce coach. And I was like, mm, I don't think so. And then about five months later, I was with a group of attorneys over in D.C. and they said the same thing. One of them said the same thing. And I thought, hmm, maybe that is. Maybe that's something I should consider. And then. That's really how it started. It didn't climb out of any thing other than those two comments. Sure. Now, do you have experience personally with a high conflict divorce or yes. a OK or alienation? OK. I do. I went through a high conflict divorce, very high conflict, many over a decade ago, and there was a return. And there, you know, and I, Karen, and I did have alienation. I, but it it is no longer. However, I don't want to paint a super happy, glorious picture. Our family is impacted. Our family was fractured. Our family was hurt. My children will always carry the scars. They went to, they finished high school. They went to college. They have degrees. There's no way anybody climbs out of this without scars. Mm -hmm. They have good jobs. They have apartments. They have friends. They have significant partners, but the pain is there and it always will be. But the best so, we can do <laughs> is yeah. recognize that. And, and when you have the skills, to address it and know what to say, not what to, and, and sometimes not saying any is more yeah. work. Mm, so powerful. I like mm -hmm. that. And I love that you have experience and the professional side to help people through this. Now, do you work with attorneys or partner with them or do you get referrals or is this on your own? How do people find you? Oh my gosh. I refer people to certain attorneys. I don't get anything for it. I know some really fabulous attorneys of the United States really get this. And attorneys send people to me. People find me through the TED Talk, to that TEDx Talk. They find me through my social media. They find me. <laughs> I, I'm I very direct. The clubhouse. That's the clubhouse. clubhouse. That's another. <laughs> I do. Oh. We are doing some really cool things coming up. I'm opening up an institute really soon where we'll, we will have a lot of resources for people to that are free. I also have some online courses, especially in parental alienation. I have one that's 
really inexpensive where it's three hours where I talk about why the alienator alienates about an hour of that, then also the legal system, and then a third hour on how to speak to the children. It really gives people a foundation of this really happening to me and they get it. And the people who purchased that reached out to me and said, oh my gosh, how is this happening? How does somebody actually know exactly what's happening to me? So we will have that. We are also going to have a retreat soon for people who are getting divorced in this kind of environment. So there's a lot of great things. I do have coaches that work with me because I'm limited in coaching, but the PA cases, parental alienation, alienation cases are the ones that I handle. We will be doing larger master classes because I am one person and I'm really direct. Uh, I love that about you, by the way. What did you say? I love that about you, by the way. No, I love direct. No, no. Well, I'm direct because oftentimes people come to me, unfortunately, when they have a hearing in a month or settlement conference in two weeks, or they have a trial in a month and a half. And while they may be traumatized or have PTSD or whatever it is, we got to get working because they're going to be in court. They're going to be in a settlement. They're going into mediation. And they're going into this with somebody who's very high conflict, who's going to walk in calm, cool, collect, charming, and conniving. And they can't be all over the place. They can't be anxious and angry and agitated and afraid and crying. And I mean, they got to get it down to, to business. So that, that's the biggest challenge when somebody is so broken down, how to move forward because something is around the corner. There isn't a lot of time. They don't have the benefit of time some often, which is why I always roll back. If you're starting this out, let's get it in the beginning. Get the right counsel. Have your nice little team. You will definitely save money in the long run. And that long run's not that far away. Divorce doesn't have to go on forever. You know, it's a finite event, hopefully. I've seen some of them go a little longer than they should. If you have the right team, it doesn't. Yes. Yes. So you uh, like the like information you like people get a hold of you? What can they do? My name is my social media. My website is my name. Instagram is my name. Everything is my name. And I do it that way because my clients are exhausted and they don't want to remember something <laughs> that you really I forgot what that was. So my name is, is sufficient. And, and people should really watch the TEDx talk. And if they want to make comments, they can. I respond to the comments. Keep the tissues. <laughs> I'm near about every two months or so. Try to do it more frequently. Sometimes that's not easy, but it will validate what they're going through. Thank you, Mickey. It, it struck a nerve with you. Sure did. Well, thanks for being our guest and sharing all this wisdom and background. I learned a lot. I really appreciate your time and everything. And Kendra, we should mention, right, something about the jailbird and the juvenile delinquent, right? Because we now have something that's out there and people can get a hold of it. And it's going to refer to us, Kendra and Mick. But which one of us is the jailbird and which one is the juvenile delinquent? In any case, get a hold of us at the Aftermath Healing at gmail.com and we'll send you a copy of that so thanks again susan for a great episode until next time appreciate everybody listening liking subscribing sharing and positively reviewing us on apple Podcasts. Till next time day is full thank you